So today we are going to study a little bit more about what's called a din mufla. Din mufla, mufla actually means like marvelous or like unknown. Din mufla is understanding an maybe an unknown law, a law that hasn't been completely or or fully explained to us uh, by Moshe, or f- as we received from Hakadosh Baruch Hu in Sinai. So, ki pale mi davar na mishpat. Right, if there should be a law that is uh, above you that you do not understand, that is unclear, ben din le din. You know what? I'll I brought the English version. Let's let's read it in full in English. If there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment, between blood and blood, between plea and plea, between stroke and stroke, even matters of controversy within thy gates, right? It could be a law that hasn't been fully explained to us. Uh, I'll give an example now. Uh, For instance, Kiddush. On Shabbat, we do Kiddush, right? The Torah says, you shall remember you should remember the Sabbath day and sanctify it. Okay. How do we sanctify the Sabbath day, the seventh day? What do we do? The Torah doesn't say. Um, we didn't even receive a tradition, an oral tradition from Moshe on how do we sanctify the seventh day. So we have a question, what do we do? So then you shall rise and get thee up onto the place which the Lord, the God, shall choose, right? Go to the place where God has chosen, that's Yerushalayim. That's where the Supreme Court sits. And who shall come unto the priests, the Levites, and unto the judges that shall be in those days, right? And you go up to whoever is presiding in those days, and they have the authority to make judgment and who shall inquire with darashta? In Hebrew, it says with darashta, and we saw that is the same root word, or has the same root as the word derasha. Derasha is a, a homily. And I shall declare unto thee the sentence of judgment. And using a derasha, the the hachamim or the judges shall declare a sentence, and decide what the halakha is, okay? And they shall do according to the tenor of the sentence, which they shall declare unto you from that place which the Lord shall choose, and you shall observe to do according to all that they shall teach. Okay, and that's ve'asita kechol asher yurucha. Right, and everything, whatever judgment, whatever sentence, that they decree, that is what we shall follow. So the hachamim in their times, they said, how do we sanctify and remember the seventh day? Because maybe at the beginning, before the hachamim came and decided that we are going to do it on a glass of wine, because um, the, the, the real meaning of Shabbat is to meditate and study about Ma'aseh Bereshit about Genesis and the creation of the world and how the world used to not exist and then it came into existence and there were uh, uh, seven phases to that creation and on the seventh day uh, God rested he ceased creating he stopped creating what does that mean? that is maybe the original understanding of you shall remember the seventh day and sanctify it. Eventually the Chachamim came along and said, no, we are going to decree that this sanctifying of the seventh day will be on a cup of wine, and that is what we call Kiddush. And from then on, that is how we, uh, how we keep this misva of remembering the seventh day. Okay, so let's get into the Din Mufla. Pirusha Mishnayot, 
זאת אומרת, זה דין מופלא, הם דינים שנלמדו באחת המידות. Right, these are any one of those uh, laws that the Hachamim derived using the 13 midot. We said they have a toolbox. The toolbox has 13 different tools. Gezer HaShava, Kelal Uprat, Ubahem Nofelet Machloket, Kmo Sheamarano. Right, and we say in these dinim, there could be, uh, there could be debate among the Hachamim. Because this, this is not something that we necessarily received uh, in an oral tradition. Right? So there's controversy. There's a debate among the Hachamim. Some say, no, uh, you know, we're going to do Kiddush on a glass of wine. And someone else says, no, a shot of vodka is enough. And someone else says, no, you know what, let's do it on whiskey. Shachar Amadi. Right, so there's different debate among the Hachamim, and they have to now convince each other. And it says, no, you know what, we're going to do it on wine. It says, Zuchrehu ala yain. remember it on a glass of wine. Uh, how do you, how could you prove your point? How do you support your claim? And it says, Zichro kiyen Lebanon. There's another pursuit that says it's, its remembrance is as the wine of Lebanon. Zichro kiyen Lebanon. Say, af ma sham biyayin, af kan biyayin. As it says over there, zochrehu, remember together with wine, you have to use wine, so too, when it says zachor et yom shabbat lekadesho, then too, we shall use it, we should do it with a glass of wine. Ah, oh, okay, so some of the hachamim now are maybe convinced, uh, some are still stubborn. You have in the Sanhedrin, uh, a minority wants to still do kiddush on whiskey, and the majority says, you know what, uh, we're going to go according to the opinion that says kiddush should be done on a glass of wine. When if tzak bahem madin kedat harov lefiakilanim, and according to these 13 laws, they have a debate, they convince each other, there's a majority opinion, and then they set the law according to the majority opinion. All right, so this is when they have a debate, when it's, uh, how do you call it? When it's something that's left up to, uh, up to, uh, let's say, the judgment, right? It's not something that we received in tradition. And that's what the Hachamim say. Right? I remember this phrase. Uh, towards the end, not today, towards the end of uh, this class, we are going to analyze one of the Midrashim of the Hachamim, a well-known Midrash, uh, which really needs to be properly analyzed. All right? Im halacha nekabel. If this is a law, settled law, something that we received from Moshe, nekabel. We accept it, whether we agree with the reasoning or not. It's tradition. We have no argument, no claims against it. The imladin, yes, teshuva. However, if you're using one of the midot in order to prove your point, yes, teshuva, there is an alternative argument that can make just as good sense as the one you just presented, saying, basically saying, if you're using your logic, all logic can be countered. I can give you a counter argument for your logic. And this is true, by the way, uh, is, is true regarding, uh, the Rambam says in his book on philosophy, says the arguments for a world being created out of nothing and the arguments for the world being eternal, or if you want to translate it to today, the argument 
for God existing or for not existing, logically, right, they're, uh, they weigh each other out. For every logic, there could be a counter logic. However, if we have a Masorit, right, we have a tradition that we received, and we saw our Masorit is based on a testimony that we appointed Moshe and we testified to his encounter or our encounter with God himself, we accept our tradition. And there will never be a debate among the Chachamim uh, on things that uh, we received in tradition. Betimtzaim bechol atalmud hokrim al derche hadin she bignalam naflam machloket bein halukim. And throughout the entire Talmud, right, you see when there is a debate between the hachamim, the Talmud is trying to get to the bottom of uh, the debate. What well, what is his opinion? What's the underlying logic? of his opinion. What is the pasuk he is uh, basing his statement on? What is the pasuk and what is the deen, right? One of the, which, which one of the 13 midot is he using to prove his point? And the, this is what they say in the Talmud, it, what is their debate on? What's the point of their debate? Right? What is the reasoning of this rabbi? What is between them? What is the difference between them? Right? Because they'll go according, because maybe they'll go according to a certain opinion or a certain school of Hachamin will follow a certain opinion. Uh, of one of their teachers, they say, okay, so this Hacham that is now in the debate, he is relying upon the teaching of a Hacham from a previous generation. But the other Hacham who's in the debate, right, one is relying on the Biuda Hanasi, and another one is relying on Rabban Shimon uh, ben Gamliel, for instance. And they had a debate back in their days. And the objective now is to try to settle the debate and make a Pesach Halakha. Bedin Hagado. The Supreme Court, Shedarshu Ba'ahat Min Hamidot, who uh, applied right one of the thirteen midot in order to extrapolate a law from the text of the Torah. Right? They use their own discretion, their own judgment, and uh, the Supreme Court came out with. Uh, with a certain hora'a, uh, with an instruction, with Danudin, right? And they made Pesach Alacha. And they said, for instance, that uh, Kiddush needs to be done on a glass of wine. Ve'amad aharehem bedin acher, right? And later on, a later bedin, maybe uh, uh, 10 years later, Maybe a thousand years later, a later date din comes along. And he says, you know, I disagree with the reasoning of the Beit din for saying uh, that we should be doing Kiddush on a glass of wine. All right, this Bedin, the later Bedin, has the authority to annul that interpretation 
and come up with its own interpretation as it sees fit. All right, so a later Bedin will say, right, they say, remember on wine, why? Because the Pasuk says, its remembrance is as uh, the wine from Lebanon. It says, but you know what? Maybe I'll, I'll come up with another Pasuk. I think it makes more sense. Maybe because uh, in that generation they didn't have wine or wine wasn't considered to be uh, such a, a special uh, a beverage and uh, they'll make some sort of uh, hora'a, some sort of deen. And they'll say that, you know what? No, it's uh, you should do it on a glass, uh, a cup of coffee or a cup of milk. And they'll bring a pasuk to prove their point. And they'll base it in the same type of logic that the other previous hachamim did. And it's completely within their right and within their authority to change the instruction of the Beidin. Shine'emar, as it says, Ela shofet asher hahem. Right, you must listen to the judge that is in those days, in your generation. Doesn't matter what previous generation uh, uh, Supreme Court decided. If a new court, Supreme Court, a later one, uh, has different reasoning, then you follow the reasoning of your Supreme Court, the one who's living in your times. Right? You only need to follow the Supreme Court in your generation. And this is extremely important. This is maybe one of the fundamental principles of our Torah. It says, and you need to know this, that prophecy doesn't help when coming to instruct in the Beidin, right? Even using one of the 13 Midot. If there's a debate in the Beidin, are we doing Kiddush on Shabbat on wine? or on a glass of coffee, and uh, someone claims to have an evoah, and he says, God spoke to me, and I can prove it. Later we'll see how an Avi proves his point. God spoke to me, and he told me, no, you should not do uh, kiddush, not on wine, and you know what, not even on a glass of coffee, but on a glass of Sprite or Coca-Cola. It says, Nevoa doesn't help. We don't listen to the Navi. He has no authority to instruct us in this manner. Ela, ma she yaase Yehoshua ufinhas b'inyane ha'iyun v'hadin, hu ma she yaase ravina b'ravashi. Right? Whatever Joshua and Pinhas decreed in their Beit Din, or the way they decreed in their Beit Din, Right? This is the exact same way that the Ravina and the Ravashe, who are at the end, the complete end of the Talmud, right? The editors of the Talmud, when they came to uh, make Pesach Halacha, they used the exact same rules and reasoning, right? Yehoshua had prophecy. But he is at the exact, when it comes to uh, uh, participating in in the debates in court, his prophecy is irrelevant and he is ex on the exact same level as any other um, any other of the judges sitting in the court, whether it's an early court full of Nevi'im or a later court without any Nevi'im at all. Aval l'she'elat mahu yitron ha-Navi uf'ulato b'misvot. All right, so what then is um, the advantage of a Navi, someone who speaks to God and his, and his authority regarding this vote and telling us, instructing us what to do? 
מן היסודות הגדולים והעצומים שעליהם נשען הדת ויסודו. Alright, this question of where the Navi has authority and where he doesn't with regards to instructing us, he says, Hainafshi, Hainafshi is a way, it's like, it's like an oath, a swear, he's saying, for the life of me, this is one of the greatest fundamental pillars of Judaism, is to understand uh, where the Navi has its authority, where he derives his authority, and where he doesn't have any authority. Because he has no authority to change the Torah. Okay? Uh, any questions about uh, this section? Okay. So I will be moving on. Uh, the next section uh, is Horataut, uh, say a wrong instruction. We're going to skip this today. The wrong instruction is to deal with when the Beit Din comes up with an erroneous instruction, uh, when we can rely on them and when we cannot rely on the Beit Din, which I think is very important. And also certain fundamentals of Judaism rely on understanding this. Uh, however, since we already started talking about prophecy, I want to skip to the next part, the next section, which deals specifically with uh, the authority of prophets and prophecy. And then uh, in our next lesson, in two weeks, we'll go back to the previous uh, section that I am currently skipping. Okay, so some uh, the extent of the authority of the Nevi'im. The Nevi, right, the prophet. אפשר שתהיה נבואתו לעצמו בלבד, להרחיב ליבו ולהוסיף דעתו. ואפשר שישולח לעם מעמי הארץ, לבונן אותם ולהודיעם מה יעשו. All right, so first of all, there's two purposes of prophecy. The first and primary purpose of prophecy is for the prophet's own sake. All right, it is Shabbat, and he is meditating. He is pondering on the unity of God, on uh, the creation of the universe, right? Certain things, you know, he reached a certain level in his understanding and he reached a certain level in his studies. And there are certain things that, you know, are already beyond our current scientific understanding and beyond what our logic uh, can take us. And then, when he's in a state of deep concentration, HaKadosh Baruch Hu comes to him, puts him in a prophetic state, and teaches him, and uh, informs him of things that were previously uh, beyond his understanding. Right? So the first, maybe even the primary objective of prophecy is to understand deeper ideas uh, from God. And he could be sent as a messenger by God, meaning he doesn't just speak to God to learn, but he actually gets a message to go out and distribute. He could be sent out to any nation, not necessarily the Jewish people. And we see this with Yonah. Yonah, which you read on Yom Kippur, was a prophet who was sent to Nineveh, uh, one of the Jewish people's uh, enemies. And he had a message to them from God, maybe to teach something to that nation, or to instruct them in an action, not just something intellectual, but an actual practical instruction. Uh, and when he is sent as a messenger with a message from God, God gives him a sign. He needs to have some sort of sign in order to authenticate and corroborate that he indeed spoke to God and what he's saying is true. 
Uh, and this kind of uh, an art is doesn't have to be something miraculous. It could be, uh, it, but it has to be an accurate prediction. For instance, uh, at 12 o'clock tomorrow, it is going to start raining. And there's going to be thunder and lightning, and it's going to carry on for exactly 30 minutes and 17 seconds. And after 30 minutes and 17 seconds, it's going to stop. That is an accurate prediction that nobody could know if God didn't tell him himself. And if that comes true, among the other criteria, then we will say, okay, this is a true prophet, and we will listen to what he says. But not anybody who comes and gives us an accurate prediction like that, we necessarily accept him as a true prophet. However, it needs to be somebody who he's already well known as a great hacham, a great sage. And it's no surprise to us that he is a prophet, that he or he transitioned from being a great hacham to a prophet. We know that he is one of the leading scholars of the generation, and he has the proper behavior of a true hacham and prophet. He behaves, uh, uh, you know, morally and justly. And then he comes and he gives us a precise, accurate prediction saying, that God sent him with a message for us, only then, only then, or we, we're commanded to listen to him. Right? You shall, you must listen to him. Okay, any questions regarding that? All right. Moshe Rabbeinu. This is a different category of prophecy and authority. Moshe Rabbeinu, Lo he'eminu bo Yisrael mipne ha'otot she'asa. All right, we say a prophet, when he comes to us, he has to give us a prediction, or it could be, it could be um, some sort of miraculous, uh, uh, um, some sort of miracle. He says, Moshe Rabbeinu, Am Yisrael did not follow him or believe in him because of the miracles that he performed. Right? Any of the miracles that he performed for us in the, in the desert, right? He did it for a specific purpose. Right, he needed to uh, sink the Egyptians, so he split the sea, and he closed it on the Egyptians. Right, we had a need for food. He brought down the man for us. And so too, all of the other uh, miracles that Moshe did for the Jewish people. So what then is the source of our belief in Moshe, our trust in Moshe? Anybody have any ideas? Hashim, What's that? Uh, I think uh, that Hashim himself recommended him and how do we know him, that? It's written, uh, Elav Tishmaur. Well, okay, but that's for all prophets. So what's special about Moshe? It says, At the revelation at Sinai, 
we witnessed Moshe's prophecy. We partook in that prophecy together with Moshe. We don't need proof of his prophecy because we witnessed it ourselves and we heard it ourselves. And uh, how do you call it? The voice or the sound is talking, is speaking to Moshe. And we hear Moshe, Moshe, Lech emor elahim kach vechach. It says, Moshe, Moshe, go and tell the people uh, this and that, so and so. We witnessed it ourselves. Vechenu omer. And so it says in the Torah, panim befanim diber Hashem imachem. Right? Face to face, God spoke with you, with the people. Nimtseu elu sheshulach lahim hem haedim al nevuato shehi emet. All right, so it turns out that those people that Moshe was sent to, uh, they themselves are uh, are the are the witnesses to his prophecy. And therefore, there is no need for any uh, prediction or any miraculous event, right? Because we witness the prophecy itself. נמצאתה אומר שכל נביא שיעמוד אחר משה רבנו אין אנו מאמינים בו מפני האות לבדו. All right, so therefore, it is not enough for someone to come and give us a prediction or an accurate, uh, an accurate prediction or some sort of miracle for us to believe in him that he is a true prophet. Anybody that comes after Moshe, right, that is not enough. That is just one criteria for us to believe him. Right? If he does a, a great uh, how do you call it? miracle, then we'll listen to what he says. Oh, and if this prophet does an even greater miracle, uh, then uh, how do you call it? Then, uh, then maybe he has more powers. He's closer to God and we should listen to him. So why do we listen to the prophets? Ela mipne ha misva shesivanu Moshe b'Torah ve'amar im natanot elav tishmaun. All right. So the authority of the navi does not derive from his claim that God sent him, no matter what prediction or miracle he gives us. The authority of the Navi derives from the misva in the Torah that tells us if he gives you a miracle, then you listen to him. And this but is I, very, I have a very question. important to understand. Yes. Sorry, I have a question then about uh, Moisha. So uh, this from, from this information from, from this uh, psukim, it is clear that then Moshe became the prophet in this definition only after the Sinai um, because I like I checked the psukim in the Shemot right now and Hashem told him explicitly to tell the um, Israel before the Mount Sinai to listen to him that Hashem will eventually take um, them out of Egypt and perform the miracle for them to believe. So it's if it's like from this definition, Mo Moishe became the prophet only after Sinai or before that, or if if it was like the the, the whole life. <laughs> the, you mean first I of all, clear. First question. of all, that is an excellent question. Um, Let's see, do, does, do I get into it here? No, I don't get into it here. Um, it is something I want to address, and I also think it's something very important related to our times, Purim, leading up to Purim. Uh, so I will address it in length. Um, let's see. Let, let, let's just finish this point. And then I'm going to get into uh, your question. Okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. 
So first of all, is, is this point understood? The entire authority of the Navi derives from one place. Right? Remember we said in the first class that we had, we said, where does God have the right to tell us what to do? I said, so what if he created us? Nobody asked him to create us. Where does he come off telling us how to live our lives? The great question of Sam Harris. And we said, God has no right to tell us what to do. So why do we follow the Torah? Is because we accepted the Torah upon us in a national uh, event, right? And we accepted that Moshe is a true prophet. Why? Because we witnessed his prophecy. We appointed Moshe to represent us to God. God represented Moshe to represent him in the Torah to us. And we contracted a covenant together through Moshe. One of the 613 misvot that we contracted is that if God sends somebody to give us a message and he brings us some sort of miracle or accurate prediction, and that person is somebody who we'd expect to be a prophet, then we have a misvah to listen to him. So the authority of the prophet comes from the misva that Moshe gave us to listen to a prophet. And the authority of Moshe comes from our acceptance of Moshe and our witnessing of Moshe being a prophet. Is that understood? Lefichach, therefore, Im Ahmad Navi Veasa Otot Umofetim Gedolin. If a prophet should come, right, and do great miracles, he, you know, he's not, he's not going to split the Red Sea. He's going to split the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, he's greater than Moshe. Ubikesh lehakhish nevuato shel Moshe Rabbeinu. Right, and he comes and he has great miracles and he comes to deny the nevuah of Moshe. We don't listen to him. Because the only reason that we ask the Navi to provide us some sort of miracle or prediction is because that's what's required by the Torah that Moshe commanded us. How are we going to accept the prophecy of somebody who comes to deny the prophecy of Moshe, which we witnessed ourselves? So if somebody, if a prophet comes to deny the authority of Moshe, then there is no reason to listen to him to begin with. The only reason for us to listen to him to begin with is because Moshe commanded us to. But if you're denying his authority, then there's no reason to listen to him anymore. Understood? So so, um, when uh, the Am Israel before... Um, before before the Sinai and everything, before they, they started, when they started to um, accuse Moshe of um, like false testifying and of saying wrong things, when uh, Egyptian Pharaoh was sending a lot of like uh, humiliation right. and punishment. So, so, it's so not pay considered attention to the first encounter Moshe yeah. has with God, right? Yeah. The first encounter Moshe has with God at the burning bush, Mm -hmm. God says, I'm going to give you two signs to show the people. And what does Moshe respond? He says, He says, they're not going to listen to me. You're giving me some magic tricks. Right? This is Egypt with the greatest sorcerers in the world. 
So you give me some cool magic tricks. So I turn all the water into blood and I bring uh, frogs or uh, how do you call it? Or uh, uh, crocodiles out of, uh, out of the Nile. So I turn my staff into a serpent. Many, we saw many of them, the Egyptians were able to imitate at to some degree. It's not, he's not saying the Jewish people are, are suspicious and uh, uh, skeptical. Because the Rambam later says, Anybody who believes because of some sort of uh, a miracle, he always has some sort of a doubt in him. Now, the Jewish people left Egypt, all right? And they crossed the sea, and then they encountered Amalek. And in this encounter with Amalek, it says, right? Remember what Amalek did to you. Right, that they came, they came from behind, they rear-ended you, and they started cutting off the tired and the weak. Right, you are tired and weary. Right, and have no fear of God. You don't believe in God. Wait a minute. Two minutes ago, they just came out of the Dead Sea. And over there, it explicitly says, And they believed in God and his uh, servant, Moshe. So what happened? How is it saying that the Jewish people have no fear of God? And the answer was already given to Moshe in his first encounter. He says, He says, they're not going to listen to me. And then God, go over the Pesukim, he says to them, he says to Moshe, he says, and this is the sign that I sent you, that you shall worship the God, right? You should worship me, God, on this mountain. Meaning, all the miracles and all the predictions that God gave Moshe was kind of like a, a band-aid. All right, we need to take care of the Jewish people now. I can't come down and reveal myself to them uh, in front of you in Egypt. We need to go out to the desert for that. So, I'm going to give you all sorts of temporary fixes so that they'll believe in you and follow you. But Moshe knows it's not going to last. And God knows it's not going to last. And he says, don't worry. The real uh, proof that I sent you is that when you come back to this place with the nation, right, um, I'm going to reveal myself to everybody. And that's why it says at the end of Har Sinai, it says, uh, right? All this was done so that this fear of God will be instilled in them forever. And also in you, they will, they will rely and they will believe forever. Everything that Moshe brought to them up until then was temporary. Now it's forever. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Any questions? Uh, I don't know if I remember right, but there was one miracle after that Hashim said, and they will believe in you forever. Is, was it the, uh, the water from the rock? So, something was uh, after. 
After I don't recall exactly. Uh, um, it was formulated like um, uh, now they will um, they will believe in you le'olam forever. Right. So he says v'gam becha ya'aminu le'olam. That's that. That is after the uh, after uh, the revelation of Al Har Sinai. Um, He's saying, yeah. what was the purpose of the revelation of Har Sinai? Was for this Gam Bicha Ya Aminu You know that they witnessed okay. it, and therefore, because they witnessed it, there's no there's no uh, contradicting it anymore. Uh, well, I I am not sure. I think it was one one uh, one occasion uh, after uh, that was like uh, now it's really forever. Okay, I'll but, uh, I'll, I'll look it up, but I can't uh, I can't recall that. But I'll, I'll look okay. into it. Okay, I, I maybe if you see it, uh, send it to me. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. All right. So now uh, we said that the whole, right, the authority of the Nevi'im stems from Moshe. And therefore, any Navi that comes to deny the, uh, uh, what Moshe said or deny the Torah, uh, there is no authority, there's no reason to listen to him to begin with. Now, in Ya'amod Ish, right, if someone shall come, Ben Misrel Ben Min Ha'umot, right? Could be Jewish, could be non Jewish. Maybe his name happens to be Muhammad, and he claims to be a prophet. And he does some sort of wondrous miracle. God sent him to add a 614th misva to the Torah, or to annul one of the 613 misvot. Or even to interpret one of the misvot uh, in a way that contradicts uh, the tradition that we received from Moshe. He's going to say, no, uh, God spoke to me. And uh, you know what? This, this is going to keep the four minim that we do on uh, Sukkot, right? The four minim. Just uh, we're going to use uh, God said to, he's, he's tired. He's tired of the etrog. Uh, he wants us to use lemons. From now on, lemons. Lemons. That's, that's the four minim. Okay? Harezinevi Shekin. This is a false prophet. For he has come to uh, uh, he has come to contradict the Nevoa of Moshe. The Nevoa of Moshe, Moshe's prophecy clearly states that the Torah is forever. Right? Right, this misva, there's a few things we need to understand. There's one, Adonam, it's forever, it stands forever. You can't annul or change any of the terms of the covenant. But also, it's lanu ulvanenu. We say Moshe kibel Torah misinai. We say Moshe went up to the heavens. The Midrashim record Moshe fighting with the angels and taking the Torah and bringing it down to earth. Right? It says, Lo he, the Torah is no longer in the heavens. Moshe kibel Torah misinai umsara, and he transmitted the Torah, and he passed it on to the Bet Din. The only ones who have authority over the Torah is the Bet Din. Lanu ulvanenu as, and our children after us forever. It will never be in the realm of the heavens anymore, only in the realm of earth. Right? So then what do we need a prophet for? 
if a pro if prophet can't come and tell us to change the terms of the agreement, all right, to modify uh, or to amend anything in, in the Torah, only the Beit Din, then what do we need a prophet for? He doesn't come to make law or to change the law. But to command us to continue following the Torah. Right? They're like poets and they're they're like artists, and they come to encourage us, and they come to, to motivate us to continue and to follow the Torah and to warn us of what can happen if we don't follow the Torah. As the last one of them stated, right, Malachi, at the end of his prophecy, he says, And this is the end of prophecy. The last prophet, his last words to us were, Remember the laws of Moshe, my servant, the servant of God. Right? The prophet could come and instruct us to do things that aren't a matter of law. For instance, um, stand on your head. Go to a certain place. Go up to war today. Or don't go out to war. Abstain from this war. Go and conquer certain lands. God instructed me to tell you to go and conquer certain lands. Build a wall around the city. Well, this city doesn't need a wall. It's fine. In those cases, Misvah Lishma Lo. It is a commandment you have to listen to the instruction of the Navi. And anybody who goes against the instruction of the Navi, sorry, right? God will, uh, God will, uh, you know, uh, close his gor hajbon with him. And if a, a prophet who is already an authenticated prophet, and we already accepted him as a prophet, he met all the criteria. And if a Navi should come, someone who is proven to be a Navi, and he says, um, we need to not keep Shabbat. This Shabbat, not keep Shabbat. Comes to one now, one misvah, a few misvot, ben kalot, ben hamurot. They could be light misvot and they could be a uh, 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 heavy misvot. Lefi sha'a, temporarily. This Shabbat, I want you to build a wall around the city. You have to listen to him, except for Abu Dazara. That's the one exception. The Navi has the authority to instruct us to annul a misva or many misvot temporarily, uh, but not permanently. Right? This is under the condition that it's only a temporary instruction. Like Eliyahu in the Carmel Mountain, Sheikrim Ola Bahus Virushanaim Nivhara. Right? He brought sacrifices on the Carmel Mountain, which is in Isur Doraita. You are not allowed to bring sacrifices outside of Jerusalem. So, how is Eliyahu, the greatest prophet, one of the greatest prophets we ever had, bringing sacrifices and telling people to bring sacrifices on the Carmel Mountain? Right, and it says, and if they would come, the people would come to Eliyahu, and they would ask him, should we uproot what it says in the Torah, uh, that you shall not bring your uh, sacrifices any place, but there's only one place? He says, no, of course not. We're not uprooting the misvah. Anybody. Whoever brings a korban outside of Yerushalayim is hayav karet. 
כמו שסיווה משה, אז משה אינסטרקטד. אבל אני היום, however I, today, temporarily, this one time, אקריב בחוץ בדבר השם, I shall bring a sacrifice outside of Yerushalayim by the instruction of God. כדי להכחיש נביאי הבא for a certain purpose, in order to denounce all prophets of this time. וכן אם עקר הדבר מדברים שלמדנו מפי השמועה, or even if he uprooted something that we learned by tradition, temporarily, או שאמר בדין מדיני תורה שהשם סיווה לו, oh sorry, says but if he comes to change, however if a נביא will come to change a tradition that we received from משה, or that God instructed him that a law should be according to a certain opinion, this is already beyond the scope, beyond the authority of a prophet. Right, if it's coming to instruct something permanently, this is a false prophet, and the big dean punishes him by death. Even if he brought the greatest miracle in the world, right? Because he comes to uh, contradict the Torah that says the Torah is no longer in the realm of the heavens. Lo However, temporarily, if it's a temporary instruction, same with that the big dean. We saw last week has the authority to give a temporary instruction that goes against the Torah, right? We listen to him in every matter except for Avodah Zara. And uh, this is, I think, one of the pillars of the Torah. Without understanding where a Navi derives his authority from and what are the limitations on the authority of a Navi, right, then the Torah could be easily annulled. Because anybody could come around, right, if another David Copperfield comes around at this time, claims to have some sort of great powers. Right, and we're going to listen to him because he has seemingly, you know, he could make uh, the wall of China disappear or make the Empire State Building disappear. And now we're going to give him some uh, sort of, you know, rely on him for our religion. Then that's it. That's the end of the Torah. Any questions? I was just wondering one thing. Um, let's say that there is a prophet, a Navi, who is accepted as a prophet. He has done all the tests, but he then goes and says, let's get away, let's go away from Torah. This doesn't count. We shouldn't keep Shabbat anymore and, and other things. And this is just ridiculous. But let's say that he is then accepted by the community but me as an individual feels that no, 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 what is going on? I don't agree with this. Um, am I in the wrong or, or what, how, how should one, an individual uh, okay, so take a stand? As, as, such as an individual, the only tools you have, and even the big dean, the only tools you have are the criteria, is he... Uh, is it someone who we'd expect to be a prophet? One. Two, does he bring a prediction? By the way, once he's already established as a true prophet, we don't need to continue asking him every time he tells us something, uh, even as a message from God, to give us a prediction or make a miracle. Uh, what he's already established. Does what he say contradict the Torah? Meaning, is he... Is he coming to annul the Torah permanently or even one aspect of the Torah permanently that automatically makes him a Navi Sheker? If he says it's temporary, God told me for the next month, don't keep Shabbat, 
or for the next month eat pork, right? Then you have a misvah to listen to him. There's no longer an isur. It's not, it's not just an isur. If you want to eat pork, you eat pork. If you don't want, you don't. If he instructed you, for this next month, I want everybody to eat pork for whatever reason God told him, right? But just for this month, you have a misvah to do as he says. Is he really a true prophet or a false prophet? We have no way of knowing that ever. Our obligation is to follow the misvot of the Torah. And the misvah of the Torah says, under these circumstances, you listen to him, and under these circumstances, you reject him. Okay, so I as an individual, if, if there is someone who is accepted as a prophet, who says that we should never keep Shabbat anymore. This is just over, completely over, forever. That's it, he's done. And if we yes. have a big deal, I can say, has an obligation, I'm, done. I'm not yeah. going to listen to you. I, as an individual, can say, you're done, I'm not going to listen to you. Not just as an individual. As an individual, you don't listen to him. Mm -hmm. And as a national institution, the Supreme Court has an obligation to bring him to court and to punish him by death. Okay, so but, but just ponder, what if they don't? What if they say, oh, okay, we should listen to him? I, I'm just saying crazy. This is crazy, but... That's, that's a, no, it's, it's a great question. And that is exactly what the section I skipped this week and will study next time is about. Oh, okay. When the Supreme Court uh, makes an error, what is, uh, up until when is it our responsibility to uh, not follow their instruction, meaning we need to know that they made an error and can't rely on them, or at what point is it uh, their responsibility? That, that'll be our next class. Okay, thank you so much. My pleasure. Anything else? Yes, excuse me, please. Yes. Do you have prophets today? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. And most okay. people who claim to be prophets today or to have any kind of uh, what they call the whole the Holy Spirit or Ruach HaKodesh mm -hmm. are people far from the criteria of being a prophet. So you have a lot of people. Look, in the, it says in the times of Eliyahu and Avi, right, there were thousands of prophets. Thousands of, they, they weren't all true prophets, right? The equivalent today would be all these um, called gurus, right? Um, people who make up their own religion. They could be very convincing and very charismatic and get a lot of people to follow them. And they may actually think that God sent them, right? So the Torah doesn't really differentiate in that way when it says, it says prophets, it says anybody who kind of like behaves like a prophet. How do we know that they're a true prophet? Is first of all, they have to be very well versed in uh, scripture, in Torah. They need to know the law. Um, I, I, there's, there's, I have a whole class on prophecy and you know how it works and how prof, what are the criteria to become a prophet, not to accept someone as a prophet, but for you to become a prophet. And um, it's, uh, I, I'd say no, I don't think there's any true prophets today. However, we are expecting, hopefully, by... Uh, uh, you know, by the time uh, we build the temple and so on, that uh, prophecy will return, meaning it could be any day. Thank you. Welcome. Pleasure. Thank you, Sami. Excellent class. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And okay, so our next class is in two weeks? Or? In two weeks, yeah, in two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah. Okay, so enjoy.